It Anything. sucked the life out of our industry. Yeah. I mean, not without sugarcoating it, man. I mean, it really did. And it changed a lot of how things were done. It changed the mindset of people. Um, you know, when you start changing people's habits, that's that's a big thing. You know, you can't go to the bar for a four o'clock beer with your buddies. And that's go that, and that's a 30 <laughs> days. And, and guess what? You find something else to do. And, 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 and the bar and restaurant owners can attest to the fact that, you know, that... Something that really, man, hasn't really came back 100%. I mean, no, it it... This episode of Tap and Table is presented in part by Edelweiss Restaurant, one of my co-host Matthew Schnipper's Side Dish Dozen supporters. For over 50 years, this family-owned German restaurant on the south side of Colorado Springs has invited guests to enjoy their wide-ranging menu, full of German favorites like schnitzel and bratwurst, to more continental fare such as chicken cordon bleu or their pesto-crusted salmon filet. With strolling musicians on various nights, three blazing fireplaces in winter, and an authentic beer garden in summer, guests are transported to another world at Edelweiss. Their European-trained Swiss pastry chef bakes all of the desserts from scratch, so save room for one of the rich torts or pastries, available for pickup or pre-order for any special occasion. Make your reservation today at edelweissrest.com, or give them a call at 719-633-2220. Prost! This episode is presented by Red Gravy Italian Bistro, located downtown at 23 South Tejon Street. Red Gravy offers a wide range of authentic Roman dishes, from made-to-order Alfredo to twice-baked lasagna to their unique take on spaghetti and meatballs. It's not just the place for pasta, but also delicious entrees, the best St. Louis-style pizza around, local beers on tap, and craft cocktails with an Italian spin. Red Gravy is celebrating eight years. With convenient parking in the city admin building, Red Gravy opens daily at 11 a.m., with award-winning lunch specials and amazing weekday happy hours from 4 to 6. Red Gravy has curated a user-friendly wine list of 18 wines by the glass. Their Wine Wednesday offers half-price bottles all day long with tastings in their Blue Room Bar. Stop in for a quick lunch or book a table for dinner at redgravyco.com. Just go. How about You're that? Just go. Yeah. Uh, welcome to Tap the Table. Uh, this is an exploration of Colorado Springs' food and beverage scene, really sort of as seen through the eyes of different brewers, chefs, and other notable members of our community who have helped sort of shape how our scene works. You want to do the second sure. part? I'll cut this up. <laughs> Gosh, we are from That's today. great. We're here today with Travis Flett, who's been a staple for craft beer in Colorado Springs for the past few decades. From his time at beer, as beer ranger at New Belgium to helping our local breweries, Travis has been has been as hands on. Okay, you, all right. I, I I just wrote it. You can just you can just ad lib it if you want. I could. You know who Travis is. I do know who Travis. Yes. Is. All right. This will go at the Hi. very end of the episode. <laughs> you want to start over one more time? I'm going to start one all more right. time. Hold. Okay. Welcome to Tap the Table. This is a conversation. Uh, ugh. I don't even. I can't even say it anymore. Tough, tough, tough day. No. Welcome to Tap and Table. This is a podcast about Color Springs food and beer, uh, where we talk to chefs, brewers, and other notable individuals that help our scene uh, grow and be what it is. So today we're here with Travis Flett, who's sitting over here on, on the other side of Matt from me, and he's been working, you know, in the Color Springs beer scene for the last couple of decades. Uh, first as as a beer ranger for New Belgium, and then has worked for a number of different organizations here. Uh, local breweries that have helped, uh, really helping them with their their sales and other uh, branding type pieces of their of their breweries. Uh, and he's actually going to be moving on from Colorado Springs here very shortly. So we brought him in, figuring an ex- exit interview was going to be the best way to really pick his brain and and get some of that institutional knowledge uh, out of him before he departs. So Travis, thanks for joining the show. Yeah, you bet, man. Happy to be here. So one of the first questions that I've I have to ask is really, how did you get first started working in craft beer? Okay, it's a great question. You know, and it actually started, I was working for a distributor that was full book. Um, when you say full book, it, the wine, spirits, beer. However, uh, the beer portfolio was was tiny, tiny back then, you know. Um, there was It was Major Brands was the name of the distributor back in central Missouri. And they were known for their major brands, you know, the big, the Bacardi's and the big spirit brands. And um, I was actually a delivery guy and I was d- just making deliveries and 
they um, they had a beer division, and I was like, man, that'd be fun, you know. I'd I'd, I'd rather do that than driving a truck all day, you know. And so. The position opened up, and I ran the beer route, and it was literally J.W. Dundee, Honey Brown, Guinness Brewing, and Grolsch, Schlop Tops, and, and that was it, man. It was two beers, really, and um, and then one day, they're like, we're getting a new brand. Um, had this funny, had this bicycle on it, you know, and it was all cool in Colorado-like, you know, and, and we got New Belgium, and I just... I don't know. It's really it's hard to really put into words the emotional attachment I had with that brand when it came to the house. You know, it was like, man, this is cool. And I I, I distinctly remember reading the side of the label, and it said, um, "Thank you for drinking this labor of our love. Um, we would love for you to stop by and say hi, Kim and Jeff." And I was like, "Who does that?" You know, like. I'd never seen relational marketing um, on a bottle of beer before or probably in any brand at that point. And so I just had an just immediate gravitation to the brand. The beer was amazing. It was this, you know, living in central Missouri, you know, two hours from the king of beers. You know, it was um, it was something new and different and with flavor and color. And it was uh it was awesome. And so I guess that's really how it happened, you know, working for that distributor and getting the new Belgian brand and being exposed to one of the most iconic craft beers to ever sell in this country, you know. It was pretty awesome. That's awesome. So how long were you a beer ranger for then? So, yeah, so I, I worked at that distributor for two years and from 2000 to 2002, and then I took the job with New Belgium in 2002. You came here for that job. Uh, well, I actually came from Columbia, Missouri to Omaha. Okay. And I was in Omaha for five years, and um, uh, I wanted to get to Colorado. That was my whole goal, really, getting to work for them. But I was like, I'll go to Zaire and work for you guys. I don't care. <laughs> well, you're going to Nebraska. Okay. Were you technically a beer um, ranger for New Belgium at that point? Or you were I still was. A okay. Yep. But I, you got yep. the title. So I got the title as beer ranger, um, Husker beer ranger. Husker beer, Husker ranger. beer ranger living in Omaha. And, um, honestly, man, it was awesome. Omaha was a really cool hip town. You know, their culinary f- experience was really amazing. Um, and the beer scene had been tapped by Boulevard, you know, Boulevard was two hours away. So they were, they were drinking the Boulevard Kool-Aid, man. And, you know, I came in, you know, with an uphill climb, you know, honestly, cause they owned it and they were doing, interesting sales tactics um we call it a false front line and that means that you know they say it's on sale i remember the the pricing still it was on sale for 11.99 i'm like that shit's been on sale for two years 11.99 so it's on sale but it's you're saying it's like when you drive by the the, the little strip malls and every mattress store is a sale every every day yeah so it was that yeah it's 11 i'm like when we go on post off we're post off for two weeks at our sale price, you know? And so that was something I learned, like, well, they do a false front line, so they're always on sale. It was eleven ninety nine. It was a wheat beer that was extremely drinkable for the domestic drinker. So that's really how they made it, you know? Their, their, their um, flagship was their pale ale. It sold half of the volume that their wheat did. So, you know, I, I, that was my challenge, was to become as relevant as Boulevard in a town that had embraced that and so i had my work cut out for me you know it's a it's a big uh, brand to go up against oh yeah especially at the time when new belgium was still sort of you know that small barely outside of colorado six states when i started six states all in the mid you know missouri um um colorado arizona you know and it it was it was a very small footprint would that have been like year five for them so no actually new belgium started in 96 so um actually you're right man probably yeah close to about uh, eight to ten years old you know and uh they had brought in peter buchart and really which gave them immediate credibility you know i mean you got a belgian brewmaster from rodenbach brewery taking over and starting a wood beer project that has become second to none in North America, you know, and so it was, uh, it was exciting, man, you know, it it was, it was more than beer, you know, it was, we were, you know, 
buying wind credits and we're, 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 we're wind powered, you know, and um, like I was talking to you earlier, just the, the system that Jeff had put into place and, you know, minimizing energy and reusing, you know, steam to heat the next batch. I mean, it was just all this stuff that was like, wow, man, it was it was something to get behind, you know. And a lot of it's commonplace, com- commonplace, commonplace now. In, in breweries now. Totally. And at that point, you know, it wasn't it wasn't the normal thing for a brewery to do to, to recapture energy or true you know. story and I think we were the only I think we were the only second brewery to have a Merlin um, brew kettle and so you know when you heat up a, 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 a of wort a massive batch of wort it takes a lot of energy well Jeff and um, I think if I I want to say Sierra Nevada and potentially Pyramid had um, a Merlin and if you looked inside the brew kettle it was a huge cone. And so the, the wort would be pumped up this in the middle of this cone and then cascade down. So now you're heating about that much wort over this huge cone. Um, and and it, it would heat, it, it turned out, it, we when we went to Brew House 2, it was a 300 barrel system. The original was a 100 barrel. So it, it was you know three times the size, half the energy to make what they were doing 100 barrels at. Like it was just incredible energy efficiency, you know? and. That for me was just cool, and that was part of the sales pitch. To be honest with you, you know, you're you're selling a, an, a, an amber beer, but you're talking about our environmental standards and what we were doing, you know, and that was really resonating. I think, and that honestly helped build the brand. And it wasn't greenwashing, you know. I think there were some there were some people that were thought that that was the case, you know, some of the smaller um, entities. But it, it truly was it was what was important to Kim and Jeff, you know, and. In case we don't come back to it later in the episode, but, while we're on that environmental or sustainability topic, um, since it's been bought in recent years by the Kieran company, all that, have they maintained that? Was that part of the they ethos absolutely that had have. to travel? You know, hey, if you buy this, this is how we operate. Right. Yeah. No, they, they have just embraced all of the culture there and have continued to push that and wave that flag, really. And I commend them for that. You know, do you feel like they were sustainability leaders of the day? Uh, to, to our knowledge, I mean, that was 100%. that was the pioneer of who was doing one hundred percent. Yep, yep. Um, and it wasn't always the cheapest thing to do, but I know that uh, Kim Jordan, you know, she 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 said that she always wanted to test untested technology because you're never going to get that new thing unless. You, there's a trial and error period that you try new stuff, you know, and, and it may fail and it's probably going to fail. But you, once you hit that one thing, it, you know, it's really going to become something that's um, empowering. And, and, and that was the, the way we operated, you know, and I, you got to commend that. You know, sounds like your your success as a salesperson also was you were behind it. The authenticity was there. You believed in the mission. You saw what was happening. Yeah, it's easy to sell when you have that buy in. It is. You take a bullet for the team, as they say, you know. Yeah, man, it was an easy one, too, you know. They took such good care of us as, as employees. We, were, we weren't employees, you know. We were co-owners, you know, giving you a piece of the pie. You yeah, know? explain that for anyone who didn't know how that worked. So, you, you know, you got shares, and the longer you were there, the more shares you got, you know. And um, when the company was doing well, you would get a profit-sharing check, you know. And uh, that was something that I'd never been ex- had experienced as a young man, you know. And that was, that was cool. Um, and I'll never forget my very first one. I had been with the company for less than a year, you know. Um, and... I, I got a, you didn't get a profit sharing check. Actually, that was a bonus because you had to be there a year before you actually got profit sharing. Um, but I got a bonus, man. I, you know, like, and, and it was a handwritten from Kim to Travis. I know you're going to do well in Nebraska. And it was like, not only did she write it to me in her own uh, handwriting, you know, she knows where I'm working. <laughs> you know, it, was, it, was pretty, it was pretty epic. You know, she was really hands-on and, and was hands-on up until recently. But, um, but yeah, it was easy. Like you say, it was easy to get behind, you know? Yeah, they were the quintessential Colorado brand for a number of years. Um, I want to sort of talk about the just the Beer Ranger program as a whole because yeah. that was such a different sort of uh, approach to selling beer where a lot of breweries um, you know, worked with a distributor and the distributor did all the sales. And right. it really, the, the education aspect of it and that sort of hands-on uh, system really wasn't in place until New Belgium started putting out beer rangers. And yeah. I, one thing I do want to just ask real quick is, what number beer ranger were you? Do you know? You know, um, it was probably the 15th, 
Okay. I, I mean, I was the 93rd employee hired. Okay. Um, we should go that part. That's- yeah, number 93. And when I left, it was 800 and something. Yeah. You know, so that was just give you an idea of the growth piece. But um, it was it was a small circle of guys and girls, you know, that were out waving the flag. And and you say beer ranger. And that was the unique piece to that. We weren't just a salesperson like we could go in into a cooler and have as much, you know, um, knowledge of the beer system and how everything worked. You know, and if you've ever been into, a you know, an old Chicago or, you know, somebody that's got 50, 80, 100 taps. It's a pretty confusing situation in those things. And, I mean, we had, we knew what we were doing, you know. You could go in and talk comfortably and with confidence. And not very many salespeople could do that, you know. And I think that's what definitely stood us apart because we could have those conversations and fix. Heck, we were fixing stuff on the fly. And what did that equate to? That equated to, well, we're going to give old Travis a a line because this, you know, because he helped us out or whatever. And, I mean, I think New Belgium realized that, you know, just having a salesperson was good but having a ranger was better yeah Yeah, for me it seemed like you you could both talk the talk with the business side of people but then also you know rub elbows with the bartenders and the the guys in the back washing dishes to to be able to sort of like there's that rapport you build across the whole organization of every every account that you you touch 100 percent. and you know they always said when you walk into a bar don't automatically assume the person behind the bar is you know a, a bartender or you know a, a, a glasses cleaner it could be the owner because they're hands on so you know you approached everyone with the utmost respect and just you know treated everyone like they were the owner and there's a lot of times that I'm glad I did that <laughs> you know because that's that a, a perfect example take everybody back to Southside Johnny's right like that guy um, he was taking the trash can out he was cl- cleaning tables that he was doing it all man and if you didn't know Johnny you, you wouldn't have known that he was the owner and um and that was the epicenter of New Belgium sales, man. When I came here, uh, my boss is, was like, "Look, man, you take make sure you take care of Johnny." You know, <laughs> he, he's we've got four lines in there, and we, I mean, you know, back then you're selling easily two to three kegs of each brand a week, so you're talking a ten to twelve keg account. It so, takes a lot of accounts to get that now, you know. Right. So, How did you go from, you know, Omaha to Colorado Springs? Like what, so, so you were at Beer Ranger in Omaha. Yes, what, sir. what brought the Beer Ranger to the Springs? An opening. <laughs> yeah, it was an opening. And, you know, everybody was, you know, going back to the mentality of, of what people's perception of Colorado Springs has been forever. You know, I mean, it's nobody wanted to come to Colorado Springs. And I'm like, this guy in Omaha does. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> had you started your family yet or you were traveling? I had. I had okay. started my family. Um, my wife comes from a family of skiers, you know, and they had skied in Colorado. Um, and so it was exciting. Um, and really, like I said, I mean, that was a goal to get to Colorado. Um, and I feel like, yeah, I put my time in five years in Omaha and uh, it opened. And I'm. they were kind enough to say, Travis, you're the man. Um, and they moved me out to Colorado Springs, man. And I bought a house in Holland Park and I've been there, you know, ever since. Yeah. So 18 years, I think, 19 years. That's an obvious question for someone uh, who, again, doesn't really understand the sales side of beer that's invisible to the drinkers who aren't paying attention. Um, you're selling kegs to restaurants. That's one goal. And then what? Products to liquor stores. That's Correct. The second. Is yep. there anything else uh, uh, that's part of that? Or, like, walk us through your mission as a ranger. Yeah, you know, um, it's to just grow the brand, obviously, and distribution grows the brand. So more points of distribution, more bar, more tap handles, more um, uh, SKUs on the shelf, all those things. Um, and so, you know, getting your beer into a liquor store was great, but, you know, then you have the, 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 the conversation, look, you know, we want to be eye level. We want to be fat tire it has to be right at the very end, right on the handle, we call it. So when you open that handle, the, 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 the lady that's, you know, shopping with her kid, holding the kid and, and everything, it's an easy grab. I mean, that was the mentality, you know, and um, and our standards were stiff, man. I mean, it had to be that way. How do you achieve it? How do you get that uh, um, shop owner to say, sure, take that spot. We know that's prime real estate. Is yeah. And, and you know what? Honestly, I think back then, you know, it, other than the big, big guys, the macros, Nobody was doing that in the craft beer world, so they were pretty much, you know, they knew that Fat Tire sold, and it was it was a great brand, um, and I think it was just the the relationship piece, you know. They 
people genuinely liked me, man. I, I wasn't the guy that came in and just pushed them into a corner and said, hey, you know, I mean, it was a, it was a conversation and all of my accounts became friends, man, honestly. And so it was easy, but uh, there was always the ones that were hard and, you know, they would give you a little grief, but then you would explain to them, so what's your best selling craft right now? Well, it's fat tire. Okay, well, you should be right here so everybody can see it. Um, and then you have the occasional, well, you know, it sells so good, it could be on the bottom, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and, but, you know, <laughs> negotiate those, those spots. And, and that was part of the plan, you know, get it. Had to, you want it to look just right and all the, all the fun POS and stuff like Not that. Not to jump but, at, you know, again, too far, but, but you've worked other, for other companies since. I'm imagining now there's saturation. There's so many good craft beers out there that are all vying for that. It's got to be harder now than it was then to do that same job. Would you agree? Hundred percent. It's it's incredibly more difficult. And and now the 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 big the big distributors control those sets. So they're they're coming in with a schematic that's, hey, Mister Retailer, this is what your cooler's going to look like, and they've got all their brands in the key spots. You know whether that's the Coors distributor or the Bud distributor, and they're building those sets. And so if you're a uh, um, Go Pesh doesn't can yet, but a, a Red Leg or um, a Pike's Peak, you're probably not going to get in the set, you know. So you're going to go in there after they've opened, you know, and you're going to be down here, and then you put your sales hat on and you go and negotiate a better spot, you know. And what happens if they don't follow that schematic? Do they? Is that one of those like, if you do this, we'll give you your allotment of the rare Sazeracs or whatever you uh, yeah, are. But if you don't, there's a lot of back scratching going on. You know, and, and, and really at the end of the day, it's a hand slap, but um, they try to leverage it for whatever they can, for sure. Yeah. yeah a lot of the big guys have been getting in trouble for pay to play and, and this like, you know, they, they give the liquor stores like the, the schematic of what the coolers need to look like. And you can't sort of waver from that because then you don't get a better deal on Oh, but if like you're Bud, you're and stuff but, like but that. if you're in their house, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> so yeah. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> we, true. you know, New Belgium was with the Coors House back when it was Rocky Mountain Coors, and today Keg won. And you know, we had a great relationship with those guys. And I remember distinctly going from uh, being in a liquor house and then transitioning to the Coors guys, and in two weeks, growing 50 fat tire tab handles. You can't do that. Like, a, a, you can't do that as an independent guy, man. You just, they have so much coverage and, and own the, the market as like they do. And, and so, you know, it's, we, we benefited from that, you know, for sure. And that's what a lot of these, you know, smaller craft breweries like a Red Leg or a Goat Patch or a Pikes Peak, um, when they do, you know, negotiate a contract with a distributor, they're getting that sort of the boots on the ground from that distributor to help them not have to have as many, you know, individual people out there pushing the brand. There's already, there's already sort of an automatic. Yeah. And, it, and it was really a good, like I call it ham and eggs, man. It was a good ham and egg deal because you've got the Ranger going out, executing on the daily. And then, you know, the good Rangers will recap their week and send it to their brand manager. And they're like, Hey man, these are the people I talk to. Woof. And then they're just <laughs> like little, you know, worker <laughs> ants, man. Yeah. And, and then they go execute what you built. And so, you know, so the retailer, you know, it's not just the, the big guy coming in and doing it. It's like the little guy came in, set the ball on the tee, and those guys are coming in since it's Masters weekend. Thank you very much. Boom. Hitting and slapping it. So it's, it was a great, I mean, it still is just a great um, – System, you know. I think you missed an opportunity to call it green eggs and ham and tie into the oh, sustainability. Man. But just throwing that out there. Gosh, you could go back in time. Uh, yeah. uh, why did we mention uh, Red Leg, Goat Patch, and well, Pikes Peak? What were the three relevances of that for this episode? Well, so uh, after Travis was at New Belgium, he moved on and to really sort of help shape some of the sales programs for some of these other larger local places. But before we get into that, I really want to uh, touch on some of the impacts that Travis himself had on sort of our local scene. Uh, and it's sort of in ways that some people don't even realize. So uh, Travis, I know we've, we've talked at, at length about it, but what are, what are some sort of wild things that have hap- what happened while you were a, a beer ranger? And I'm thinking mostly like America the Beautiful Park, uh, mm-hmm. Joyride, things like that, that yeah. are now sort of thought as being sort of institutions and sort of just like normalcy. Normalcy. Almost. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, I, when we got beer into um, America the Beautiful Park, it was... It was the signature park for Colorado Springs, 
they didn't want any beer in there, forbid that happening. And, you know, we brought in the Clips Beer and Film Tour and negotiated through um, our nonprofit partner, Up Adana, and um, got the green light, man, to get beer in there. It was a big day for everybody in Colorado Springs, I think. I, I still have people come up to me and tell me how amazing that event was. I mean, it was the backdrop of everybody knows it was just amazing for that park, you know. And, and to have beer in it and, and run it, if you know, professionally was was first time anybody had ever seen something like that in Colorado Springs, honestly. And I proud to say I was part of that and making that happen, you know. Um, um, beer dinners became extremely pasteurized and uh, through time, right? Like, but back then, man, it was a cool, it was a beer dinner. What's that? You know, special. Yeah. yeah, it was a super special thing and, you know, elevate the drinking experience with great food. And, um, I probably go back to one of the coolest ones. One of the highest level ones we did was with the craft wood in. Oh, um, wow. Yes, man. Back, <laughs> back in the day when the craft wood in was ki killing it over there on the West side in Manitou and, uh, chef Jeff, chef Knight. Yeah. Jeff Knight was the guy that who has become a friend. I know Jeff. I think he's selling wine these days. But he uh, he was the guy, man. And uh, Peter Buchart, if you got Peter Buchart to come to a beer dinner, it had to be a special beer dinner. Like, you didn't just get Peter to come for any beer dinner. And so I was fortunate enough Peter was going to be on the docket to talk about the beers. Chef Jeff was killing it back there. And, I mean, it was it was a true beer dinner with, like, like when I did my five-year anniversary with New Belgium, you know, you go to Belgium and we ate out on the lawn at, at some breweries and you always ate wild game because that's what they have, right? And so that particular beer dinner was wild game, beer de Mars. I mean, it was just amazing. And, and I think I go just going back to that particular beer dinner and what that meant to, I think... Every beer dinner that ever followed that was, it set the highest highest bar that I've, I mean, honestly, it was really impressive. Yeah, I think I was doing listings back then still at the Indy in my earlier roles in the A&E editor. Okay. Um, I remember it used to always be a wine dinner after wine dinner. Wine dinners were just old hat. They, they, yep. It was hard to make them exciting anymore. And I do remember that era where all of a sudden we started seeing beer dinners in my first few. I was like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to, you know, give that an indie pick this week or whatever um, because it took that it took craft beer and put it in that same placement of the, the higher end of wine. Yeah. And it hadn't always been viewed that way. And even though the larger industry had sort of arrived and there was other like hallmarks of that, Colorado Springs has been often, you know, five years behind Denver and other places like that. So sure. maybe other markets have seen that, but for us, you're right. It was almost like suddenly there was a time and the beer was esteemed. And um, I remember some of those dinners, like at Brewers Republic back then too. Um, yeah. It just, and now, like, you know, again, those have sort of become old hat. Now you have spirit dinners, cocktail dinners, beer dinners, wine, all of it. It's great. Like, um, I think the right dinner at the right place is still very special. It can be a wonderful yeah, thing. Yeah, it was. And, I mean, that was the one. And and then other things, you know, I mean, I, I remember when we brought the, um, you remember the bike race, the Pro Challenge came through town, yeah. you know. I remember people just, like, walking down the sidewalk with beer. And I'm like... Was the liquor, was the liquor license really for the whole town? <laughs> like it's, it, that's what it ended up being, and I, it was it was it was kind of a wild west situation. But I mean that, I think it. I, I you know that being said, I think it definitely loosened the screws on a lot of um, you know permitting and stuff like that. You know, because that that was a big deal. You know, having beer downtown and um, just you know being able to walk around it, um, responsibly, and um, it was it was it was awesome. You know. Um, well, and the uh, the getting beer into the the local parks uh, for for the, for viewers that maybe uh, don't know about Colorado Springs, a lot of our park systems were donated to the city by General Palmer back in the day, with the sort of notion that they would be alcohol free it, forever. And you know, it's a, sort of an outdated idea and thought, but we still have a lot of parks that are that are still sort of very strict to that. Whereas other municipalities, other cities, they have you know you can have beer but no glass or or you know. There's, there's a little bit more leniency on that. Color Springs has always been a no alcohol in the parks type thing, which is, you know, it's changing. And there's, uh, you know, Clips of Faith and the, the Clips uh, film tour, uh, I think that's what it's now called. Clips Correct. of Faith was, was the original inception yep. of it. Uh, that really paved the way for things like Springs Beer Fest in America the Beautiful Park. Yep. Uh, there's the upcoming Frost Fest here in, in May here in College Springs Creek. that's in Bear Creek. Mm -hmm. So now the it has it sort of it kicked the door open so that all these other uh, entities and organizations can you know go through and, and have beautiful spaces for their beer festivals. So you're not just in a parking lot all the time. Yeah, hundred percent. 
Yeah, and then another thing that we did, you know, that was kind of cutting edge, if you will, was the bike ride. Like just a simple bike ride, uh, McCabe's Tavern for all the old schoolers out there. You know, we yeah. every uh, Wednesday night. I remember showing up for the first night, um, pouring rain. <sighs> Um, literally pouring rain, and <laughs> we skipped that first night. Yeah, and we, and we were like, "We're doing it." And and Tim Bergston was there. Of course, Tim was and there. And Tim uh, filmed filmed it. He was he had the uh, oh he, the, that, that, he yeah, but he was doing the advertising in restrooms. You know the 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 deal back then, um, Pikes Peak Sports, I think, or something like that. And anyway, he teamed up with us, man, and and. Um, did a little ride up on it. So we had eight people in the rain, and and then and no kidding. Within a month, we we, we were consistently running a hundred people on bicycles. Um, you know, I got to throw a shout out to um, Alan Boshaw, man. He was a huge integral part of that. Um, as far as the safety piece, you know, you got a hundred bikes going down the trail, Tejon, man. You got to have people that kind of know how to facilitate something like that. And he was a huge help. Um, up and down, it became the nonprofit that helped facilitate that ride. And I mean, but that was like. That was cool and cutting edge and new, and, not, and nobody had ever really done it here. And then, uh, and then you know, some of my other accounts. I want a bike ride. Well, man, you can't. This was, it was this was the right place at the right time. It was organic, organically grown. It, you know, and it, it became the place uh, that you like. Everyone needed to be on a Wednesday night. It, we kind of was, man. You know, something. Hey, you going to the Joy Ride? And it became the Joy Ride because at New Belgium at the time. Um, we had did a campaign called the jo the, the Joy Ride, and the bicycle rode off of the label. Yep. I don't know if you guys remember that, but like we put a, a bottle of fat tire in the market with no bike. It was just the pretty artwork, but no bike, and the bike went on a Joy Ride. <laughs> Okay, and then and then it came back on, and it had all these bells and whistles and all this fun stuff that had had been to a festival kind of, and so we're like joy ride. Well, since New Belgium is you know we were sponsoring the event and facilitating the event with the helps of Up and Down, and we were like, well, let's call it the Joy Ride, and that's what we did do, and it was the Joy Ride for several years. I I think I per personally four years in a row. I was there every Wednesday. Yeah. And and it was great, but it was consuming, man. You know, you're selling all day, and then you go and and, ride, ride a bike and have to have, miles, and then yeah. have to have all this fun with people. Man. But no, it was it was amazing. And I think we really made an impact on um you know the scene. Well, yeah, while you were I'm sorry. Go ahead. While you were telling that label story, you, you told me something before we started this episode. I thought that was really cool to hear. Um tell me tell our listeners about that watercolor art at the brewery yeah. and the story of that label that's actually pretty touching. It's pretty cool, you know. Um, so when they came up with the brand or the, the beer, um, Kim and Jeff, uh, they had a neighbor. Her name was Ann Fitch and she was a watercolor artist and they were like, we've got this beer, Ann, and uh, can you do some labels for us? And she did the Fat Tire label. She did the Three Graces that uh, encompass the um, triple lo logo, uh, Blue Paddle, um, those three, and then I think Abby, I think it was those four at the very beginning, and um, she she did them. She never wanted to be noted for it. She didn't want, like, New Belgium to publicly, like, go out and say, Ann Fitch, she's, you know, she was very humble and just was like, it's cool, I did them, that's fine, that's all, I don't want royalties. I don't know what Kim and Jeff did for her, but, like, she just was totally low-key, and... Um, to this day, you can go to New Belgium, and um, out of the tasting room, as you walk towards the first microbiology lab, you'll pass a wall, and there's three, the, the, the original watercolors of those labels are on the wall, and it says Ann Fitch, and then it, and it, the story that I just gave you, pretty much on the wall, and tells the story about the labels, and really cool, man, and I don't think a lot of people... That's why when they changed the label, we were all like, what's Ann going to think? You know, they're getting rid of the watercolors, you know? But you said you guys change it um, regularly to keep it fresh. And then there was, yeah, the, 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 yeah but the, those actual labels, they were never changed. Well, other than... Um, Little bits and pieces, but the yeah, watercolor, but, yeah, watercolor bite was always Watercolor pretty much stayed the same. And then when they changed and they completely removed the watercolor label... Um, with new tap handles and everything else. That was a sad day for a lot of us OG guys, man. I mean, because that, the, the, you could look at that original label, and man, it just, it would just, the feelings, emotional feelings you got from it, man. I mean, it was a, it was literally a piece of art, you know? Um, and it was, it was, yeah, it was the one so that I, did I remember it, you know? that Joyride uh, campaign because I was at the time uh, living in Durango. Okay. And they did a competition uh, where they gave you, 
on on the New Belgium website, they had a, a template where you could put your own photo into the 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 frame on the New Belgium fat tire label. And then the way they would do it is they would have people, you know, submit these these uh, their own images of bike riding or just having fun times like that. And then they would enter you into a drawing for a New Belgium cruiser. Mm-hmm. And I have a New Belgium cruiser in my house now because I just put a random photo of a buddy riding a bike into a frame. And they we called should, me up and they sent me an email and said, yeah. hey, we want to send you this bike. Uh, do you have like a bike shop down there we can send it to and they'll put it together? Well, at the time, uh, our bike, our garage at our house there, I was living with a couple of buddies, Kevin and Ryder, uh, down there in Durango. Uh, our garage had 30 bikes in it. So we were nice. like, it was just like, just send it to me. And it came in four boxes and literally had to be completely put together uh, oh, yeah. from the ground up. Well, I think only the wheels were built, and that was the only thing on it that was like put together. But it, it's still sitting in my house right now. It's a great bike, and it's, it's one of those things that, that New Belgium also did year after year is put out a different version of their New Belgium Cruiser, mm-hmm. um, yep. both for giveaways at, at different events, but then also just for their, for their employees to, to have and ride. Yep. May I borrow it for a joy ride? Yeah. Yeah. Right on a New Belgium cruiser. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. It is. Uh, it's great for flat and downhill. It. It is. It's not a climber for uphill. <laughs> yeah, they're not light. <laughs> no, it's, it weighs like sixty pounds. Let's just say that. But um, do you want to jump from New Belgium to some of the other places? Yeah. So, port, Travis. Or? Yeah. So, I, what what Matt alluded to, you know, after your tenure with New Belgium, uh, you've helped sort of shape the the sales. Uh, regimen and, and even just sort of just helped some of the local brands here in College Springs, uh, you know, really get a foothold in, into the local market. Can you give a little bit of just background on how that came to be and, and your experiences uh, with, you know, working in sort of a smaller mm-hmm. version of what you were doing previously? Yeah, you know, I think for me, it was really one, I really wanted to go to a small place and take all that experience, knowledge, and and see how it would transfer to a small brewery and goat patch was the first one for me to do that with you know i i had known johanna um who runs the place pretty much here at, at goat patch and i knew darren from trinity and so yeah, they were both trinity yeah uh, they were both at trinity huh? yeah yep. and so i kind of you know I, I i matter of fact when i moved into my house in holland park trinity was being built i rode my bike rode my bike to the gym and I was like well look at those are stainless steel tanks man okay I know what that's gonna be and so I got to know Darren and stuff so anyway scrolling forward you know uh, when this happened I knew it was Darren and them and and I was like man that'd be cool to work with those guys um and um just so people know we're talking about Darren Bays Darren Bays yes brewer and owner co-owner here correct yeah um and so yeah you know that was really how it happened and then they were fortunate I was fortunate enough for them to bring me on board and they knew my history and, and what I had done on the sales piece, and I had had the the relationships that I had in town, and that's a, a lot of it. And so, uh, came in, and Darren um, whipped up an amazing hazy IPA right at the forefront of the hazy IPA explosion, and I took it and ran with it. And you know, they they were wanting to do their their, their uh, you know. It takes a tribe red. I'm like, no, we need more hazy. I'm like, everything's hazy. Let's go. Let's. And I said, look. And I looked at um, Justin Grant in the in the in the face, and he remembers the conversation. I said, look, you have a beer that everybody in this town would would die to have, and let me do this. And let's when you have you have a little window man to, to really run with something like that and i said let's go and and he he did he they 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 said let's go you know this is the one that's going to put him on the map and do you think it's put him on the map it's, it's everywhere it's everywhere just it's saying. everywhere and, yeah. and, and 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 so that was that we were running out i was running we were running out of beer man you know and what we're doing another seasonal that's gotta be hazy in those things man like it was just it was literally like that and um that's and it's a good problem to have you know but um that was really how that's i got it everywhere man um and i say i can't say i you know i had a robert mitchell bunny you know he was my right hand man and i'm you know he was green and just learning the industry he had worked a little bit at bristol but you know um he was implement, you know, huge in, in getting me to help get that out and get it into all the right places.
places and and I feel like we did you know I know people would come through and be like what's up with this goat patch you know it's I think it's and, synonymous with with you know, where goat patch is now too like you know there's there's yeah, the the 100%. technical uh achievements like with it takes a tribe and, and yeah uh some of the, the wins that they've had yeah. at some of the beer big beer competitions but if you go to any place in town and they have goat patch on tap there's a good chance that it's hazy and and, and, and i would say there's a probably a big percentage of people think that's just that's all they do you know <laughs> i mean because really like back when i was in new belgium man not to regress but it's just like you work for fat tire well no i don't work for fat tire i work for new belgium new what new Okay, it's fat tire. You know, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. really how it was. And I think there's a little bit of that here because, you know, when you have a brand that big and, and that just dominating, people just see that and know that. And that's just, it's, you know, that's... Where we're... Um, you said that, like, uh, that we're still recording. Just want to check. Oh, yeah. I think it just turned off. But we're still recording. We're good. Still good? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. We'll no, it's all good. Yeah. But, um, we'll jump back in but it's a juggernaut of a brand. Yeah. I was going to say, we should also note, and you've probably figured it out by now by the imagery behind us if you're watching this, but we are filming today at Goat Patch's uh, Tap House. Uh, so thanks to them for hosting us. Um, they're also one of my Side Dish Dozen members, so I want to appreciate them for that. Um, and yeah, it's funny when we were talking about the hazy being everywhere. Um, I mean, the Roadhouse Cinemas is just you know half a mile from here, and that's a place where you can watch a movie and drink hazy, which is one of the like, yeah. most... <laughs> that's like a treat still is to go and just be able to drink that during whatever film you're seeing. So I know that's just one example of the many, many places you'll find that. But yeah, it became like, you know, Bristol's done such a good job of getting their beers on all the taps. And mm-hmm. everyone, you know, beehives everywhere, right? But I feel like Go Patch Hazy is like the next iconic flagship local Springs beer that you just find everywhere. It is. And it's not, and it doesn't even have, uh, it's got a third of the longevity of, you know, they've been around closer to a decade versus Bristol's 30, but um, yeah, I think it speaks a lot to say that you put that on the map <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, and you know, I mean, it was it was the timing. The timing's everything in life, and um, I, I just feel that you know, we just took advantage of an opportunity that you only get once, one in a lifetime for some businesses, right? Like, yeah. I mean, and you just. You just, like I said, you just hit that accelerator and give it all you got, you know, and until that wave ends. And you know what? I, I don't know that the wave has ended yet. It's, it's still moving right along. Mm-hmm. Um, albeit, you know, probably not drinking as much, um, you know, hazy IPAs as I once did. And I think there's a lot of people like that, but I've, I've lived it, you know? Yeah. Um, but we're, we're, we're fine. Cool. Cool. Somebody, I don't know why that came up that quicker than the other one. Cool. So, cool. Um, keep, keep going. But right. yeah, so you know, that was like my first, uh, you know, and I think I was honestly still searching for that, um, trying to check all the boxes, you know, that a company like New Belgium, <coughs> excuse me, had had given me, and you know, I was never gonna find it. I was never gonna find that next place, man. You know, it just we. I, I remember talking back in the day. We were like uh, my coworkers. At New Belgium, we're like, man, we're gonna, we're gonna. These days, we're gonna talk about these. These were the good old days, you know. And back to the comment you made earlier, you know, the competition. The competition was Odell, Sam Adams, um, Ska, maybe, but not really as relevant here on the Front Range. And I mean, it was just, we owned the market, man. I mean, and and we did it at a high level, and there was no arrogance to it. It's just that's what we did, and mediocrity wasn't acceptable at New Belgium, like you had to be good. It was very intimidating, to be honest with you, going to New Belgium, um, because like everybody was just wicked good, man, you know? And like Lauren Salazar running the running the um, department, you know, the QA department, and, and then she just completely turned that around and made it amazing, you know? And it was like, I'm just a just a kid from Missouri, man, you know, and, and it was it was really intimidating, and but it was it was great because I learned that, you know, if you're gonna do something, do it, man, give it everything you got and do it the right way, and that's how they they did it, and that's why they became so successful. But, um, but but Go Patch was great, man. I, it was great. I you know who knows what would have happened had the pandemic not hit. You know that's what that's what ended my time here. You know, unfortunately, pandemic hit. I'm the lead sales guy. Not selling bars and restaurants are closed. Guess what? We don't sell, we don't package beer, so we don't even have liquor stores to sell because we don't have cans. So, like literally, I had no job to do, and that, and that was that, man. And I mean, um, 
it was, did, a, it was a tough time because I think right before was. that, uh, you know, the boat patch had just just started a, an agree or just a, a relationship with uh, Sleeping Giant up in Denver for some more increased production. Yeah, which then you know, as we, if you know, it's not happening anymore. But that that pandemic just sort of put a damper on all of pretty much every brewery's production and expansion yep. goals and, and it, anything. It sucked the life out of our industry. Let's, yeah. I mean, not without sugarcoating it, man. I mean, it really did. And it changed a lot of how things were done, changed the mindset of people. Um, you know, when you start changing people's habits, that's that's a big thing. You know, you can't go to the bar for a 4 o'clock beer with your buddies. And that's go, and that's a 30 days. And, and guess what? You find something else to do, and and and, and the bar and restaurant owners can attest to the fact that you know that something that really man hasn't really came back a hundred percent. I no, mean, it hasn't. It, it hasn't. I mean, I, you know, we talk about the old days. I would meet Matt Pomeroy to throw out an old name. He was the Odell rep. Um, him and I would meet on the West Side Front Range Barbecue, um, who has always been you know a craft beer um, connoisseur, you know, and we would talk about new accounts. Um, share knowledge, man, about the industry, that doesn't happen much anymore. Like, you know, because to your point earlier, you know, that's gotten so competitive. Nobody wants to share information, man. Like, it's like, oh, this place is opening up, and I'm not telling anybody because I want three lines because they only have ten. I'm not going to tell my buddy because he'll probably get two, and then I'm only going to get one. I mean, there's that mentality now, and that, that mentality simply wasn't there back then. I mean, it was it was a smaller... You know, the pie was the same size, but not as many slices, you know. And, I mean, it was – we were happy to share knowledge. And I honestly – I tried to carry that on, that on for a long time. And, um, you know, just because that's the beer industry, it should be. And, and unfortunately, post-pandemic specifically, like, it just – we lost that, that cultural piece of, of, of just sharing information and, and the friendships and stuff. It became um, – it became bottom line, man, you know, sadly. Yeah. I mean, and that's, I get it. You got to make, you know, you got to make money, but it, the fun got sucked out of our industry in the pandemic. And, and, and I think it's, it affected more people like myself that have, had gotten to go through the, the craft boom. The and you know, now you're, you're comparing the two where somebody that really wasn't in the, the boom and lived what we lived really had nothing to compare. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it wasn't that big of a contrast. And so, um, but yeah, man, you know, uh, who knows? I would, I could potentially still be here had that not happened. So, um, that was the first time in my life, um, that I drew unemployment, man. You know, it was, it kind of felt dirty, man. But it was like, this is legit. It's a pandemic, man. Like yeah. it was a totally legit, whatever. So I did that. Um, and then, um, I went to work after Patch, I went to work for Firestone Walker for a year in the middle of the pandemic because they never closed, shut down or nothing, man. They just kept just going. Better and, machine. Yeah. And I mean, it was, uh, that was always a goal of mine, to be honest. I've been working in Belgium. I was like, man, I, I want to work for Firestone Walker one of these days because, I mean, those guys do it right, you know. They, they really do. If you, anybody's been to any of their breweries, they have three of them on the coast of California, Paso Robles, and then Buellton, which is where they do their barrel works, all of their fun stuff, and they have their, their test kitchen down in Venice Beach. Terrible place to have, you know. <laughs> rough, so, rough, like, rough. So, so training for me was like you start in Paso, go to Buellton, stay in Buellton for a night, hang out with the guy that's, you know, doing all the, the barrel works and, and inoculations and all that fun stuff, and then the next two days go to Venice Beach. I mean – Wow! Right, like it was just amazing. Not, not a not a bad gig. Not I feel a like bad that. gig, and so that was you know that was a really special time. You know, I mean, like I said, the the world was shut down, man. And I mean, I remember going to Buellton at Barrel Works, and they were shut down because that's that's a you can eat there, you know, and it's out in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing there except rolling hills and and vineyards, man. It's so cool, and I'm like, we're going there, but they're closed. Yeah, they're closed, but. Um, I, I, I'm, I just can't remember the guy's name in there. Alan, maybe that's not right. But anyway, he does all the barrel stuff, and he's in there doing his thing, man. We hung out with him for a full day, you know, and it was just eerie kind of because the restaurant was closed. It was dark. Chairs were up, and we are just back in the barrel room, man, you know, geeking out. And There's a head brewer over there is Matt Brindleson. Matt Brindleson, yeah. yep. He does the, the production beers. Um, but I, the guy, I don't know the barrel guy, so. Yeah, he's, I can't, you know, he's a good friend with Lauren Salazar. You know, yeah. of course. Um, and, sort of cut, um, that, that, those two breweries are sort of cut from that same sort of cloth where they, they put a lot of emphasis on 
high quality, but then also mm-hmm. a lot of barrel aged, a lot of wood inspired beers. And, and, and something I would like to note for all the people that are just kind of that don't know beer as well is probably the three of us. You know, like there's a reason that they put their barrel works in Buellton is because they don't want any infections to happen at the production facility. So it's 100 miles away. Like literally, <laughs> like we're not going to get any funk in our Union Jack, or, you know what I mean? Like we're keeping that way down there. And so we get no contam- cross-contamination. And that's pretty wild, you yeah. know? I mean, to keep it down there. So when um, you worked for them, did you come back as a rep here? You were selling here? For I them? was, yep. I was the Southern Colorado market manager for Firestone. Um, and like I said, it was good. You know, Firestone has a history of being more corporate than most craft breweries, you know, a little bit more, um, you know, just technical and just, you know, th- th- just whatever you, corporate means to you, I suppose. But, um, you know, the head the head guy, the, the sales director was an old friend of mine, that a co-worker at New Belgium. He ran the, the California, Dave Macon. And Dave was the, you know, he said, we'd love to have you. And I was like, oh, man, I got to go work with Dave. <laughs> You know, this is cool. And there was a couple other guys that worked there that were from New Belgium. So you started to see, you know, the market and people from other breweries, you know, kind of mingling. And really, it was really, that's really cool, you know. How long after that, um, bug is, I remember getting the early press releases about Firestone arriving in Colorado. So how many years after, when you took that job, how long had it been in the, in the Firestone had been in Colorado? Man, that's a great Just question. A years, I would I say probably five, five okay. I think. At least, yeah. It was established. Yeah. It was pretty established. You didn't have your work cut out for you in terms of introducing the brand to people. It was already there. You just had to, again, get more lines, get more. Uh, well, i got to tell you, you know, it really, not so much, man. Like, it, it was, it amazed me how people, the only brand that was established was 805. You yeah. know, 805, people knew 805, but people didn't know 805 was Firestone Walker either. So there was that whole thing, you know. And so um, the distribution was there, but it certainly didn't have the rate of sale that Colorado brands had, you know. So it was it was tough. Uh, it, was a, it was a hard sell out here. I ain't going to lie. You know, a lot of people just didn't know Firestone Walker. They didn't know the history like, like Ryan knows, you know, cut from the same cloth as a new Belgian man. People had no clue of that out here, man. Which is, except for the small beer guy community, it, you know? I mean, is it hard to, like, you, because before then you'd been selling Colorado made craft beer here. Mm-hmm. So you had the local argument and all that. Yep. Now you're selling a product from California. Everyone here complains about Californians coming and tying up our traffic or whatever it is. Like, there's yeah. sometimes a negative connotation to any yep. of that, although we know there's phenomenal beer out there and we drink it. But um, was there any, was there a big difference? You mentioned the corporate vibe, but was there a big difference to be selling a out of state product? And did you have to kind of turn your hat around and be like, I got to take a whole different approach to this. What's my pitch now? Yeah, I mean, it was a different approach. Unless you were selling to somebody that knew beer. Uh, those guys, you know, if somebody knew Firestone Walker, you were in, man, because they knew the quality and what they were doing, you know. But if it wasn't, it was like, man, you guys got a lot of people from California out here, right? Yeah. Well, man, they love this beer. <laughs> so it's like, you know. It should be an easy sell. Yeah, you know, 805 was that beer for sure. So you're saying and it's like the Whataburger phenomenon. Because the so sections are here, they want the Whataburger. Yeah, yeah, so the California here, this is what yep. we drank in California. Oh, now it's in Colorado. That's what I'm going to buy today. Well, yeah, you know, I'm like, I know you like to sell local, but trust me, people love this 805. And it's a great, easy drinking beer, man, you know. Um, and that was the question I had when I was there going through training. I'm like, look, you know. What's our shtick? You know, what, what's the story? I'm, uh, you know, in 805, if you know much about the branding of that beer, it's, 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 it's a very, um, gosh, you know, uh, off, the, off the chart, off the beaten path, motorcycle, motocross, bikes, beach, you know, surfing. It's a lifestyle. They're, sell, they're trying to sell a lifestyle. It's exactly what it is. And so I'm like, and that was my question was like, how do I sell that, that lifestyle here? And... It was, I don't know that I ever got a real good answer for that because that's a tough one, you know? I'm like, it's, I get it. I totally get the 805 vibe, but it was like, how do you, how do you sell that 805 vibe in Colorado Springs, like man? Like make it for uh, rafters know? or paddle boards exactly. or something. Well, and we did. We started like trying to do some stuff that was more, you know, outdoorsy and stuff. But let's just face it, what Colorado brand doesn't attack the outdoors you have to come on man so really it was really hard it was hard to answer your question man i mean it was hard um because people didn't know it um and it was hard because it wasn't local you know um even though firestone walker well they did such a good job with the brain of 805 that people didn't know it was firestone walker to be honest with you Mm -hmm. and and that was i mean like union jack which one of my favorite favorites you know 
it just, you couldn't hardly sell it, you know? I mean, it just, because there's so many IPAs, you know, and it just was, I don't know, it was a tough sell. Well, and also but that was, that was pandemic stuff, time, though. which was 100%, everything, man. everything's completely different. And yeah, it was, exactly, that's when everything was totally everything was shut down. turning differently. Um, so, you know, a, a year with them, I always say I'm going to give a company a, a year at a minimum, and then... And if it's not, and I, eight months into Firestone, I kind of knew, man, I'm not, this is not my gig. It's, I've, it's been awesome, but it's just, I, it's not sustainable for me. And so um, I ended up um, going to Red Leg and working for Todd out there. Um, and it just didn't work out like I wanted. I, I wanted a little bit more control over the, over the brand. And I just didn't get it, and, and I totally, it was just, it was just what, what it was. I was, became a, a sales guy, and I just, I, I knew I had more in me, man, than to just go out and be a sales guy. I mean, I just, uh, I just, I wanted more from that, I think, you know, and at that point in my career, I felt like I deserved a little more, you know, and, and it just didn't happen, and I, I left there um, uh, for Pikes Peak, and that was my last entity here in Colorado Springs, working for Chris Wright, and that, you know, was going back to timings everything man you know chris really needed somebody man to come in and run that sales department and have some marketing branding experience on the back end which i did and you know uh, we did a, we did a lot of cool stuff while, while i was there you know and I was talking to you about the hoppy hoppy 12 pack you know that was something that you know um just Chris just hadn't thought about, you know, he hadn't, he doesn't, he, he, he wasn't had the role of going into liquor stores and looking at sets for like days until you're dizzy and, and then realizing everybody's got a hoppy pack. It's like, you know, we should probably do a hoppy pack. So he, like Chris does, man, he's awesome. That's why I hired you. Let's yep. do the hoppy pack. And so we did the try IPA pack, you know, and it's been a great package, you know. I mean, that added huge numbers to the to the brand, and and um, he let me play with some different um, actual styles that, you know, uh, this year, as a matter of fact, um, each quarter is going to be a different um, beer, fun, like an experimental IPA, and then it'll be a sour, and then an experimental IPA, and then a sour, versus doing just a sour program, like four sours. I think people kind of are like, okay. I need a break. So, you know, I thought, well, look, man, IPAs are still hot. Let's do a fun, different IPA, you know, Elephant Rock, Oceans of Cloud. They do great, but it's people want variety. They want new. And so, um, and they've got an Italian Pilsner that's coming out right now for summer, which I think is going to be a great injection for them, you know, but um, that was fun. I enjoyed working with Chris, you know, and Chris allowed me to do some stuff that I, you know, that I, I, you know, really felt would help the brand without being the owner that's like, no, this is my brand, <laughs> you know, and he was totally cool with it. You're you the know? one who brought us the first samples of the, the trail water, the hot water. The trail water, man, yeah, thanks for, yeah, exactly, yeah, man, I mean, you know, th the first brewery locally, I think, producing a hop water, if I'm not there's, mistaken, There's a, Ryan, there's a but, couple other ones that, that make a hop water, uh, but I don't know if they package it. I think you're yeah, the first one yeah. that packages, yeah, distribution package it and, and yeah. put it out on shelves. Yeah, and the trail water is amazing, man. I mean, it's just water, citric acid, and hops, man. I mean, that's really that's all that's in that can. And um, you know, for all you people that have been in the industry for a long time, like me, that are just like I can't do beers every afternoon <laughs> anymore. Um, <laughs> hey, man, get yourself some trail water. That stuff is amazing. It's refreshing. Um, it makes a good blender too. We were yes. trying uh, at our first uh, first episode at. Streetcar 520 and uh, the bartenders had come up with some drinks for us to try, but you know it's a great mixer too if you know what to do with it. You it's can amazing. also just mix it with like a kombucha if you have a favorite kombucha or something and find your right ratio. But um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I, I drink a lot of hop waters too. I buy others, and I think Brian does too. And those days where I want to have a dry day but want the, that hop flavor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's a, it's a winner, and I I sure hope that they're able to to sustain that and make it a viable product moving forward, you know, because it's, it's good. It's just, it's going to have to be marketed and it's a very unique new thing, you know? And I think in my short time selling it, you know, I think the retailers are have a hard time wrapping their head around it, to be honest with you. I mean, a little bit, you know, they're used to NA beers and you say it's an NA, you know, product. So they think it's a beer, but it's not a beer. Does it have, Alcohol? No, it doesn't have alcohol, you know. Is there gluten in it? No, it's water, man. Like, it's just, it was all these it's questions. Like we've you know? already like, embraced seltzers. Why is on. it that much more of a jump than, than that? But, and, right? and it's because hops. When people see hops, they think the hops create alcohol. Some people do. It's amazing, but. So as you're, you know. I mean, I feel we have to talk about uh, leaving Colorado Springs. Yeah. Uh, what are the, like, 
this is sort of like an exit interview style question. What opportunities does Colorado Springs have, and what can you know are uh, what are some of like the biggest risks and maybe rewards that the local breweries could uh, you know either have going forward, and just just tying from your years and years of experience, where do you see like craft beer going in the town, and where should they where should breweries try to you know capitalize? Yeah, that's a great question, you know, because it has gotten to be so saturated and there's so much. And, and I think I, th- I think you can always go to quality. I think the quality piece, I think, you know, breweries absolutely need to focus on quality. And that then that's from the tanks to to retail. You know, um, you just have to. I mean, you got to do that because people, you know, we always talk about that person gets that one bad fat tire. They're not. That's it, man. You know, they've had a hundred of them, good ones, but then they have the one bad one and it just, it, it does something to your brain and you won't buy it again for a long time. And I think, I think it's the quality piece, you know, and I think it's, you know, not being scared to be innovative because if you're not innovative, man, you're going to get left behind. I really do believe that. Like, what's the next new thing? I thought cold IPAs were going to have a little bit more, you know. Um, I love cold IPAs. I, I do too. I, I think, think they nice should be. They should clean, have their moment. You know, um, but I think that, you know, this is, and I think we'll probably, I think, I think we're a couple, two to five years away from history repeating itself. I think Ambers are going to come back, man. I do. I, I just, they're so easy to drink, I th- you know, and they're so good with food, you know, um, where IPAs are kind of, if it's, IPAs are good with spicy, you know, uh, a little bit more of a, you know, smaller window, but um, I think, I think the quality piece, Ryan, to answer the question is just really maintaining your highest quality and, 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 and doing what you do well. You know, and not trying to be something for everyone. I, I think that's what I've seen. Some breweries, they want to be something for everybody. And I mean, I don't. I just don't think the the beer person. That's what they're into. I think they're. You know, like you go down to Fossil. Fossil is who they are, man, and that's what they do. And they don't. You know, it's just it's quality, and and it's solid, and it's just. It, there's no bells and whistles. It's just quality, man. You know, I don't know another way to put it. And and they do what they do, and they do it well. And I think that when you start trying to do too much, I think you just kind of lose a grip on what really got you to the party, if you will. You know, and um, um, and I think if that answers your question, I think yeah, that totally. those two things. I mean, I think the the quality and being able to adjust and do things right, but maintaining who you are um, and not trying to be something for everyone. Really. What's, what's next for Travis Lett? So, you know, I'm, I'm getting out of the beer business um, after, man, 26 years, I guess, I've been doing it. And I'm going to go um, chase my dream as a disc golfer, pro disc golfer on tour. I'm going to be out uh, playing tournaments almost every weekend for this summer. Um, I have two sponsors, Fly Green Disc Golf out of Denver. They sell everything from discs to apparel to hats, everything you could ever need for disc golf. And then uh, Gateway Disc Sports out of St. Louis, they put the plastic in my hands. That's what I throw. I throw their stuff. And um, I'll be an independent sales contractor for those guys while I'm on tour to help offset expenses. Great. Um, living out of a Sprinter van. And, um, you know, look for me. Hopefully I'll get a YouTube channel or I'll be doing some type of media so people can kind of follow along, man, on my journey. You know, it's going to be a fun one. I'm excited about it. Yeah, we'll definitely link to it if you if you if and when you get it up up and running because you know I, I think there's a lot of people in this town that you know we've gotten to know you through these different events and these different you know times that we've seen you in these touch points and it it'll be interesting to see that next evolution of of Travis yeah. and, and it'll be interesting to see that disc side disc golf side of you which you know some of us you know you and I've played together we 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 like throwing plastic into trees um, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's what I do most that of happens. Uh, but so it'll be really it'll be interesting to see that other side of you, especially for the people that really just know you around, you know, New Belgium and the beer. beer. Guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would yeah. say too, don't don't leave beer behind. Maybe everywhere you go, be drinking something local and introduce us to it on your channel. That is on say, the this list. This is what uh, Travis is drinking right now. It's definitely part of my um, my uh, social media campaign. I think I yeah. think it kind of is a. Just kind of a puzzle piece that fits too well together. Yeah, you can't leave you know? beer out of disc golf. I, I, I know. So. I think you're right. And disc golfers um, are beer drinkers. Let's just <laughs> yeah, say that. Can we say yeah. that? Okay. I have, yeah, you, yeah. I have you beat, by the way. Um, I, I put my disc in a pond and gone wading in, and, and you know the one in Monument uh, Creek, yeah. the, the little duck oh, pond yeah. there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everyone, yeah. Everyone's gotten wet. I've got yeah, and I've you know 
took my shoes off and everything, rolled up my stuff. I, like, I hope I don't step in on something really sharp here, barefoot in the bottom yeah, of this. No, but yeah, that, like, I'm not leaving that disc behind. Yeah, yeah, you know, so it's going to be a different uh, change. And I, and I will say for the record that um, the I have been playing disc golf longer than I've been selling beer. So that just gives you an idea of how long I've been playing disc golf. Like, um, I played my first sanctioned PDGA tur- tournament in 98. And then I played 10 years before I ever played a tournament. So, I mean, yeah, I've been playing for, you know. You're both the old guard. 30 years beer almost, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy. And it kind of came to me. I'm like, you know what? If, I've been wanting to get out of the beer industry, like, you know, just speaking to the points of, of it not just being what it once was and everything else, you know. And, and I'm like, disc golf, man. Like, you know, Forbes put an article out, a $250 million industry that will be $500 million, um, within the next three to five years, you know. And I'm like, well. That's that's a good sign, and you know what do I know more than than beer? It's it's literally disc golf. So, looking forward to seeing how that all rolls out. I have, so. I have one final question for you. Um, we've asked everyone else about their desert island beers. I want to ask you something a little different, similar. But can you give me your top three beers? Which is going to be really probably tough after all the time you spent. But you're out whatever disc golfing. You have, you can have three beers delivered to you. Your favorite day. What what beers do you want in your hand? Um, Blue Paddle. Blue Paddle um, would be one, 100%. From New Belgium. Um, from yeah, New Belgium. That's a, that's a, yep. it's a cult favorite, I think. It, it's, it is, man. It's just a, one of the best Pilsners ever. Um, I think um, um, a, a West Coast IPA, um, and as far as a brand goes, man, I mean, that's a tough one for me. Uh, there's so many out there. Um, so I'm just going to leave it at that, a West Coast. And yeah. then uh, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Okay. That Green Label Pale Ale is still one of my favorite beers, and I just love that beer, you know. Um, it's the old school OG in me, I suppose, you know, but it's still on the shelf, and it still sells, and I never sold it. I just drank it, and it's a great beer. So, cool. well, Awesome. Yeah. Well, well, Travis, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's so, been great to sort of just get a, a quick view into your history here in Colorado Springs. Um, and for, for everyone watching, if you want to – Follow Travis along his tour. Uh, check him out. You can always search the PDGA website and see how he's doing on these tournaments. Uh, we'll, we, may, we may even link to his player card uh, just so that everyone can sort of stay involved and, and stay connected to, to someone that's been really an integral part of our local scene here. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me, man. This means a lot to me because this town, man, it was, it was good to me for a long time. And, you know, just want to thank everybody out there that, I, that, that supported me. And... Um, It's been a great ride, and thank you for that. So, cheers. 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 Have fun.